How can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. I always introduce myself to my students by saying, my name is Melissa Weaver Dunning. Yes, that really is my maiden name. <laughs> so I've always been a weaver. And I was aware fairly early on what that meant, you know, that it was a trade name. A family moved into our neighborhood called Shoemaker. And my mother said, I feel like I should go up to their house and say, hi, Mrs. Shoemaker. I am Mrs. Weaver. <laughs> I always remember that. I grew up with a mom who was very creative. She had gone to college and she had gone to a finishing school and done some art, like fashion design art. And she could draw and she could sew. She got into like Bishop tailoring. So she was always making stuff. And that was just a part of my life. She taught me to knit when I was very young, I think to keep me out of trouble because I think I was that kind of kid. I'm pretty much that kind of adult. I, it's hard for me to sit without something in my hands, something to do. When I was in high school, I had a friend who had gone to Waldorf schools. I went to visit her and she had a little table loom in her bedroom. And I thought, oh, I really want to do that. But I bet, I bet you have to thread all those little things, <laughs> which is in fact true. So I went to college in Vermont, and it turned out that there was a weaving school right in the town next to where I had gone to college. And that weaving school was run by Norman Kennedy. I had no idea of my good fortune or how much that would change my life. So I view myself as a weaver, a knitter, a teacher, a spinner. I'm a musician, which is kind of almost the other half of that equation. And I also really like to sew and stitch and mend and embroider and make stuff. And it's an interesting juggle. I'm curious how you already mentioned your mother, but how mm -hmm. creativity was seen in your family. Was it a worthy endeavor? Thing? No, it was definitely a worthy thing. I spent a lot of times as a kid outdoors, just wandering around because we lived out in the country and you could do that. But we also like made stuff and... There was a lot of music. We just had music kind of accessible to us. I remember having a little record player and a set of like children's records. And some of that was Burl Ives and folk songs. And my mom was always making stuff. And she taught me to knit, to, you know, to do things. So we learned to knit and play the recorder and make little doll clothes out of scraps of fabric. And when I was 10 or 11, I learned to sew. And in high school, I made almost all my clothes, what, whatever wasn't jeans, pretty much I made myself. So that was definitely a positive thing, definitely a, just a part of life, seemed to me a normal part of life. So it was very much encouraged. Do you think it was encouraged in terms of it's a way to make a happy life or encouraged like you may, maybe you'll make a career of it one day and that's it's okay? My dad was a journalist and he came from a family, he just had the one sister. He and his sister were both really quite brilliant, but she managed to not make a living pretty much all of her life. And I think he really didn't want his own daughters to fall into that kind of situation. So he was a lot more focused on how are you gonna make a living? And particularly when I went to college, you know, I would talk to him about what my class selections were. And I felt like that was something I needed to live up to, you know, the idea that you could make a living doing something. Um, but for my mom, it was less so. It was more, this is what makes a happy life. So you get messages from both sides. And one thing you mentioned was when you were in college, clearly you're multi-passionate and have various things you rotate through and love, and you could never just take one of those away because you need all of them. And how did that fit in terms of 
who was mentoring you or giving you suggestions when you were in college setting? Most of what I studied in college was writing and theater. I had a poetry teacher who was very clear for her, she would have liked to have painted and wrote poetry, but at some point she had to make a choice and she chose poetry and that was her life. And she really laid that on me as sooner or later, you are going to have to choose. And I pretty much decided right then that I would not choose. (laughs) You know, it's a complicated equation because I've been a musician and I've been, you know, a textile artist and I've raised children and we ran a family business. My husband and I ran this concert series, which became in the end all consuming. And all of our kids worked also for the concert series. Most of what we did was outdoor summer concerts. So we, at our peak, we ran 80 concerts in 11 weeks outdoors with volunteer support. There's a lot of hours that go into making that happen. We were pretty busy, especially, you know, seasonally, but all these things have traded off, have continued to trade off. And in the context of the concert series, I met a lot of professional musicians, spent a lot of time with them. And I really respect the the level of deep passion that led them to do what they do and allowed them to be successful at what they did But you also saw a lot of people who were great musicians, but not very good at managing themselves, but didn't feel they could let someone, you know, there are a lot of ways to pursue a path and some are more successful in some aspects than others. And for a long time, I really felt like I wanted to be a professional musician. I wanted to have the chance to prove myself. I wanted to get out there and be seen and be more exposed and all that kind of thing. And at some point I realized that I thought I was probably happier playing music on my own terms, that in a way I was lucky not to have had the one purpose and just, you know, dove into music at the exclusion of everything else, because I've enjoyed it for all these decades. You know, It's still there. It's a big part of me. I take it very seriously. I feel like I do it on a professional basis to the extent that a folk musician would ever want to, <laughs> you know, in terms of quality. But in some ways, I feel very fortunate to have been able to trade off from one subject to another and to play a lot of music with these folks here and then spend time at the folk school teaching weaving. And, you know, it's a it's an interesting and diverse life. And at one point, my husband, he was saying, oh, I should have done something else. I should have made real money, you know, running a nonprofit. You, you, you're not in the same income level as most of the people who live in your community. And I said, no, no, you just need to let go of that as an idea because we'll be okay. We'll probably always work. You know, it's not like we're going to retire or everything stops and we just be retired. That's not going to happen for us. But for us to have had the opportunity to work at something that we really believed in and loved and that impacted so many people in our communities positively and to have been able to work with our kids. So all of our kids worked with us and a lot of their friends did. We worked with, uh, we always had a big sound crew with uh, teenagers and young college students. And just that experience of working together as a family is something that you can't replace in any way. So in some ways I feel like shifting all these pieces around for all that it's a lot of work, it's also really worth it, at least for me in my life. It makes me think about how sometimes there's the pressure to pick one, but every human has so many facets inside of them. And why is that bad to honor all of the facets? You know, I know we have to generally be organized and it's true. We can spread ourselves too thin, but I do think we should feel okay to know we love multiple things and some of them might make money. Some of them might not, but that that's fine and good. Yeah. I really admire and respect people who have a deep passion for one thing. You know, I kind of look at that and go, wow, that's, that's amazing (laughs) because on some level I can't quite imagine it. Yeah. Um, You're like, what's, what does that feel like? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. It's funny Part of what I've come to realize in the last year or two is how much privilege we really have. And I've long felt that I was very fortunate in a lot of ways. So being able to make that decision of, you know, that we have enough and we don't really need more. And 
being able to take opportunities that even though they don't pay as much, you know, all those things are part of that privilege and good fortune. But it's been interesting in this pandemic year, because at some point I decided I was, well, <laughs> let me let me tell this story. Last March, a local friend, Madeline McNeil, who's a nationally, probably internationally known hammer dulcimer player and singer, wonderful, lovely, sweet, one of the sweetest women I've ever known. She lives about two miles from me or used to, and I heard that she had passed away. And in the midst of the pandemic and the quarantine, that was just too much. <laughs> it was the, the last straw. And it just, it made me deeply, deeply sad. And it made me realize how much I missed singing and particularly singing with other people. Madeline and I would see each other periodically, but we would always meet every year at this particular fair, not far from where I live in Virginia. And we would always sing together. You know, we would be working there, but you'd have a break and I'd go and find her and we'd sing The Water is Wide and we'd sing a couple of other things. And she had a high soprano voice and it was really, really fun to sing with her. And I was doing an online yoga class. The music was The Water is Wide. And I was lying there on the floor in my office, weeping, <laughs> just, you know, it, it all just hit me all at once. And when the class was over, I sat up and I thought to myself, so you miss singing. Well, why don't you just get to it? You know, what do you need? To, what do you need to do this? And so uh, April 1st, I recorded a song and I posted it on Facebook and on YouTube. And my plan was to do that for every day in April. April is National Poetry Month. And I have a friend who's a musician and a librarian who posts a poem every month for the month of April. So I thought that's going to be great. I'm just going to do this thing. So I did it for April and then I did it for May. And I think after May, I decided to go to five days a week instead of seven. That seemed like a very reasonable adjustment. And it just went on. And the last song I posted was 282. So this has been my song a day project. And I decided pretty early on that I did not want to monetize this, that the world was too weird and crazy, and that if I could give something, that that was great. Although I've maintained all along that this project saved my life, that basically, that my primary motivation was entirely selfish, <laughs> that I needed to sing. And having this kind of structure in which to record a song every day. It was just, it's amazing. The other thing I discovered is that I know a lot of songs. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, please, we must take note of the fact <laughs> that it's not just how many days is that is that many songs. Well, I have to confess, I don't know all the words. And there came a point where it's been a busy time. I've been babysitting, you know, babies and now toddlers all through this pandemic year. And so I needed to be able to confidently do a song in one or two or at the most three takes. So I've had the words handy all through it. But what I learned from that is that I know a lot of tunes because <laughs> that's, you know, that's the other piece of that. And all the music I've been listening to all these years, when, when I had an office to myself at work, I played my iPod on shuffle and it's all traditional music and mostly songs. And how many repeats do you need before that tune is firmly lodged in your head? It's an interesting thing to, to consider. It definitely is. You know how they say doing new things and dance, music, all that languages keeps Alzheimer's at bay. Right. We need to make new grooves in our brain. So doing something like that, I mean, that's some brain work right there for sure, because that's a different place in your mind than when you're creating a weaving design or when you're holding your grandbaby. Yeah. And one of the interesting things I've been thinking since I talked to you a couple of days ago about the trading off of the different parts of us. And for me, it's generally been fiber and music. I got my song project all the way up to my oldest daughter's wedding anniversary. And I sang the song that I sang with um, my other daughter and a friend at her wedding. And then I announced on the next Monday that I was going to take a break. And since then, I've been really focusing on weaving and spinning. I took some classes. I kind of reignited my interest in spinning after uh, a long time. And 
I thought I would record songs again in a week or so, but it's been a couple of weeks. And I've realized that I'm really focused into textiles right now and that I just don't really have room for the music piece right now. It's not gone, it's, but that over time, there's always been a sort of shifting from one foot to the other, but it's never been quite as marked as it has been just you know recently. It's almost like a way of batching or naturally focusing for a moment until you're ready to move on to the next, you know, that batching idea. So it's not that every day you're doing one of each of every passion, you have a focused amount of time and then you trade to the next focused amount of time. Yeah. And when you live a busy life, you don't get big sections of time. You don't get a whole day in your studio. You know, that's such a, such a rare thing. When you were on that path, you found the weaving school. I'm curious about mentors or mentorships that happened for you that when it was hard or when you were unsure or that were so inspiring, they really modeled for you, this is possible. Right. So when I moved back to Vermont, I was working probably four different part-time jobs. And one of them was waitressing in a little cafe in the town I was living in. And I've always been interested in people's accents. I did some work in theater. As a singer, you're very tuned to that kind of thing, I think. And this guy came in one day, two guys. And one of them I knew was from Richmond, Virginia, (laughs) because there's a very distinct old Richmond accent. And I've known quite a few people from there. So I could pinpoint him right away. The other guy, I had no idea where he was from. And it turned out he was from Scotland, but he didn't have the typical sort of cartoony Scottish accent. He was from Aberdeen. It has a very different kind of an accent. And it turned out that guy was Norman Kennedy. Norman Kennedy is originally from Aberdeen. He was born in 1933. He grew up between the wars, which means he lived in an environment that was in a way more of a throwback to earlier days because of the level of deprivation after World War I than during World War II. A lot of people went back to old farming traditions and other things because they didn't have fuel. So he grew up in this sort of mishmash of a modern world and and an ancient world and was himself very interested in the ancient world, in the way things had been done, in how you grow things, how you brew, how you spin, how you weave, how you make things from scratch. And when he left school at 16, he worked in the tax office and spent half the year in the office in Aberdeen and half the year out in Scotland and went to practically every little town and highland village and island. And all along this way, he's collecting all this old information, all these old ways of doing things. He came to the United States in the early 60s to sing at the Newport Folk Festival. He said when he came to America, he smelled freedom. And he made some connections and got a job at Colonial Williamsburg as the master weaver. He helped Ralph Rinsler start the Folklife Festival on the Mall, which I had gone to uh, as a child and a teenager because we lived close enough to D.C. to go. Then he moved to Vermont and started his weaving school. So I met Norman in, I guess, 1979. My younger sister went to his school uh, at the end of that year, and then I went at the beginning of 1980. And when I met Norman particularly in the context of the school, I felt like, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is what I've been looking for. This is the person I've been looking for. Although he was terrifying, absolutely intimidating. He was a traditional singer and he had all of this traditional knowledge about dyeing and spinning and weaving. I felt like at the age of 22, that I was uh, an empty vessel. And here, this is what I wanted to fill my life with. Norman Kennedy, I wouldn't have called him my mentor for about 20 years until we actually became friends (laughs) because he was seriously so terrifying. He reduced students to tears on a regular basis, not intending to do so, but because he wasn't patient and he wasn't American, he wasn't a hand holder. In that first class, it was a six week class and we started out with a paper grocery sack with a pound of raw wool in it. And we washed it, it dried, we picked it, we learned to card, we learned to spin, which has a pretty steep learning curve at the beginning, particularly learning to spin long draw where you use your two hands, 
there's not much in the modern world that we use two hands for. Uh, the first thing I think of is driving a car, but there's not a lot of skill in that. You know, your left hand or your off hand is not that engaged. You know, it has a pretty passive job to do. So we learned to spin. At the end of the second week, we wove a small blanket, having spun singles, plied them together, learned to spin pencil roving on a great wheel, plied that together for the warp, dyed a few small quantities of some of our hand spun from scratch for stripes, planned a blanket, sat down at the loom. It took about two hours to, to weave that blanket, maybe three. And almost everybody in the class said, could we do that part again? <laughs> <laughs> because the spinning, so many processes to lead up to that, um, so time consuming. And then we spent four weeks planning, designing, spinning and dyeing to make a full size tartan bed blanket. I remember standing in line at the grocery store, looking at the flannel shirt on the guy in front of me and thinking, well, could that be a blanket? <laughs> and I'd go back and say, okay, so I wanted to have these six or eight colors, and it's going to have these lines here and those lines there. And he said, too complicated, make something simpler. So I ended up with, I think, a blue and white check, dark, dark navy blue, and there's white lines going through the blue blocks and red lines going through the white. And I hit my colors in the dye pot right off. I did really, that was great. But apparently I didn't rinse them well enough. Because when I washed my blanket, the colors ran, although I pull it out every now and then and look at it and it's not as bad as I remember. But anyway, I made this bed blanket. It was five yards on the loom, 45 inches wide. You weave this long, long strip and then you take it off the loom, you mend it, you wet finish it and fold that long strip over itself. Sew up one side, cut the fold at the top and it opens like a book into a blanket. And it's pretty cool to end up with a result like that, with a 90 by 90 inch blanket that you spun, at least the weft, and dyed and wove. It's a kind of a big deal. So I thought I would be a blanket weaver. <laughs> well, it turns out not that many people want to buy wool blankets, even in Vermont. And not long after that, I was on tour with a trio I'd been singing with for a while and I met my husband. And six weeks later, I was living in Virginia. We kind of took one look at each other and said, where the hell have you been? It was a, a fait accompli. Fortunately, we still feel that way. <laughs> that is fortunate for sure. 30, 39 years later. But in Virginia, there were guilds and I joined a guild. And then I figured out I could get them to bring Norman down to do a workshop. And meanwhile, I had three children. I was able to weave with one baby and when she got bigger, she would bring me things I dropped and bring me bobbins. And, you know, that was awesome. And with the second baby, it was a little harder. And when I got pregnant with my third child, I rolled up the beam of the loom with blanketing on it and wrapped it in a sheet and put it in the attic. And it stayed there for hmm, 10 years, roughly, more or less. So there was basically no weaving. There was a little spinning. There were probably some workshops but not a whole lot going on for a long period there. But when my kids got bigger and Norman kept coming periodically, and then we started hiring him to perform at our first night, New Year's Eve uh, events, we got into a pattern where he would come play for our first night, stay at our house for a week or two. And then I'd drive him down to the folk school where he had started teaching. And not long after that, I started teaching at the folk school. I got to know Norman, not as a student, but as a friend and as a fellow musician. We were both invited to sing at the Smithsonian at one point for a program they had on storytelling and ballad singing. And it was honestly, absolutely terrifying. I had grown up with the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian to me was like the Cathedral of Rome. You know, it was, it was the be all and end all. It was the place with all the cool stuff in it and the people who knew everything. And so that was pretty exciting. But somehow, somewhere along the line, we became colleagues and friends. And it's been one of the most rewarding relationships of my life. I tell people I've known Norman longer than I've known my husband. So it's been a long relationship. There are a few other teachers who've been really important to me. Mary Elva Erf, who has studied and taught about shaker textiles in particular. I've taken a number of classes with her. Anita Luvera Mayer, who's very, very inspiring textile artist. There's a man named Frank Hart, who was a singer and a collector from just outside of Dublin, Chapel Izzard, 
in Ireland, who I met at the Augusta Heritage Festival, he really restarted me on learning traditional songs. I think I learned a dozen ballads the first year after I met him. And at that point, you know, my kids were five and seven and nine. So there was a period there where I just didn't have time to do more than raise my kids and work a little and go to guild meetings. I'm sure I was knitting all that time and spinning and things, but the push forward to learn more and really move yourself, you spend a lot of time raising those little people. <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing amount. And the cool thing about spinning and singing is they're they portable. Right. And knitting. That, I mean, that's really why I, I mean, knitting. Yeah. As engaged a knitter, because I couldn't bring a loom around, but I could bring knitting to a soccer game, to the carpool line, to all the things. That's something that you and my mom have in common, besides the fact that you're both singer, performer, musicians, and fiber artists. Every basketball game, she was knitting, you know, all that. I'm just so happy that you guys have met each other because it's not that often you can meet someone that has some of the multi-passionate stuff matching up in the way that you guys do. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think about my friendship with your mom, Martha Owen, and how we just sort of recognized each other. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you're, you're clearly one of my sisters. <laughs> you're from the same planet. <laughs> yeah. I joke that I haven't been seen in public without my knitting since 1982. When I first met you, well, I might have met you before that. I'm not sure, but what, that I really remember was in 97, I was 17 and you were teaching like a thread art class. Treasure yeah. Patches. yeah. Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. You and your mom took my class. I loved it. I still use things that I learned from then. <laughs> nice. I love that class and I saved everything we made too. And I still will look at them, but you have a very encouraging, fun way of sharing and the openness and uh, a readiness for adventure and sure I'll sing one. And I've just always really appreciated <laughs> that. I feel fortunate, of course, to have grown up around people like all of you and to have hung out with Norman and don't, Norman is responsible for getting me to the folk school. I met a whole lot of people in that class. I met, I met everybody. <laughs> I met Carla Owen, who was then the resident weaver. I met Nanette Davidson, who is a weaver and whose husband, Jan, was the folk school director for many years. And I met Ruth Truitt, who was the program director at the time. And Ruth, you know, seized on me and said, do you want to come and teach a class? And so I started teaching handwork classes during four adults during the little middle week so I could bring my kids to camp and teach an adult class. And then I started teaching some more classes so it would make it easier for me to bring all my kids to little middle. That was kind of what drove me to start teaching. I started doing tartan weaving, which has been one of my primary passions in weaving. And he really put me into a situation where I could start doing that. At some point, I realized that I was doing more teaching than weaving, partially because I did have a day job. You know, there was only so much time. And that time was really going more into setting up and preparing for classes and actually teaching classes. Fortunately, I had a lot of flexibility in my schedule at work. Working for your husband does have some advantages. And our work was kind of seasonal, so I could time classes when we weren't so terribly busy. That has really become a huge focus for me and a big part of my identity. I really appreciate hearing you talk about what your experience was like in my class, because that's all of what I really strive to be. I feel like I really want this kind of work to be accessible to people. I want them to be able to feel excited about making stuff. I think a lot of what teachers do is give people permission to learn, to fail, and to succeed. It's challenging for us as adults to learn new things. And it's really, there's a lot of risk taking involved in just signing up for a class. This year of the pandemic has given me a lot of perspective <laughs> on, on how easy it is for us to close ourselves in and the challenge of opening ourselves back up again. It's easy for me to come to my studio and sing a song because that's part of who I know I am. It's part of my perspective, but I'm really a fairly introverted person. I can be extroverted when I have a role I know how to play. 
one question I had for you was, which is, it's a little bit of an odd question, the difference, the feeling of the singing versus the weaving. You know, I was thinking about how we get to rest one part of us while we explore, explore in the other, but you kind of just explained that a little bit that one is a more extroverted thing to do. And then you can balance that out with the more introverted. Yeah. Weaving is usually something you do by yourself. Although right. I do know people who only weave in class, they come to class and they weave and they have a great time and they just, just, they don't enjoy setting up the loom. So why should they? <laughs> it's like, that part is oh, a that little painful. Me happy. I think everybody else should be too. But teaching is very much like performing. You know, sometimes I think it's about half stand up. <laughs> I also did um, a fair amount of radio in college. So all these things go together, theater, radio, performing as a singer and teaching. You're bringing energy into the room. You're creating a direction for that energy. You're giving people structured information so they can learn new things one bite at a time. Although I'm not sure if I'm very good at that. I do a lot of data dumping, I think, in class. But hopefully when people are ready for that. Sometimes I feel like it's like making sausage. You know, you've got this captive audience and we've got, oh, we have another 40 minutes. What can I tell you? <laughs> it's, it's interesting how all these pieces go together. Is there a maker, musician, creative liver, gardener, writer, podcaster, anyone who you think is fun and inspiring right now that you're following that maybe we should go check out too? I started a new job recently. <clears throat> I am the skein winder for Solitude Wool, which is a local company that makes breed specific yarns. Great, really exciting group of women. They work with local shepherds in our fiber shed. But the long and short of it is I go and work in a warehouse and I'm all by myself, which is kind of awesome in this pandemic year <laughs> where I really love my husband, but we've spent a lot of time together. So I go to work and I listen to music. Sometimes I listen to song circles from Ireland and England, and I've started listening to podcasts again. Two of the podcasts I've been listening to lately are both fiber oriented, but they're really broad. They're not just about weaving or spinning or any one thing. And one of them is Long Thread Podcast, which is done by Anne Marrow. And Long Thread Media picked up a piece of the Interweave family really the origins of the interweave publishing family. So spin-off, handwoven, and piecework when that company in its third or fourth version kind of fell apart. They picked up the original pieces and the original publisher, and they've built this really lovely, strong community and interactivity of all these products and adding digital media to it and everything else. Part of that whole package is this podcast. Anne Marrow is a terrific interviewer, and one of them is with Norman Kennedy. So it's really worth listening to. I listened to it because it was Norman, and then I went on to listen to all these other also really fascinating people. So the other one it comes out of England, and it's done by a woman named Jo Andrews. It's called Haptic and Hue. And haptic is a word I wasn't familiar with, but it's the feel of cloth whereas hue is the color, the shade, the depth. She's a lifelong weaver, but she's looking at textiles in such a broad aspect. People who design and distress clothing for films, people who work in haute couture in France, embroiderers, really, really fascinating stories and so well produced. So those are my current favorite podcasts. And I just, like two days ago, finished reading a book that is a brand new book, and it's called Craft and American History. It's by a man named Glenn Adamson. It's a history of the United States through the people who made it, literally made it, who make stuff with their hands. If that wasn't exciting enough for me to pull the history and the making together, it's also a really long overdue and very important view of the impact and the basic overlooking and misuse of enslaved people, freed Blacks, people of color, indigenous people, and women. So there's a very strong, wide, diverse view of who the crafters were, which is so incredibly refreshing and exciting to see. 
I had to read it in like four days because it was due back at the library, but now I've ordered a copy and I'll read it again and I'll take notes. And I just can't recommend that book highly enough. I should mention that although he is an academic and a muse museum professional, it is 300 pages of stories. It's really accessible. It is a long book. There's a lot of information and you may not find it all fascinating, but I still think it's worth it for almost every craft person, especially with a bend towards history. But really, you don't need that history focus either. I mean, he brings it right up to the present day, right into the pandemic. And it's just an excellent piece of work. So that's what I'm excited about right now. I want to check them all out. Great. I was wondering if you have a song you would sing for us. Sure, I'd be happy to. Hands down, my favorite song is one that I learned from Norman. It's called The Night Visiting Song. There are, in my opinion, two types of night visiting songs. They're all about couples courting at night. And this comes out of an agrarian society where people in the warm months spent all of the daylight hours working to raise food to be able to survive the winter. If you give it that sort of perspective, it makes a lot more sense. So people worked really hard all day. And so they did their courting at night. I also think of it as if a father liked a fella, thought he was okay, he wouldn't leave the ladder up to his daughter's window, but he might leave it where the guy could find it. You know, there was some tacit acknowledgement and sometimes encouragement in this too. It's, it's how the parents also courted. But there's a whole set of night visiting songs that are ghost stories. This came off of a recording. It's the first album that Norman made and he made it for Folk Legacy here in the United States. When I sing this song, I hear his younger sort of reedier voice. It's interesting how things like that change over time. Okay, so I haven't sung yet today, but I'll give you the best I've got. Mm, the time has come. I can no longer tarry. This morning's tempest, I must shortly break to cross the moors and high towering mountains until I'm in the arms of the one I love. And when he came to his true love's dwelling, he's knelt down gently upon a stone. He's whispered softly into the window. Does my own true love lie there alone? She's lifted her head off her down white pillow. She's lifted the blankets from off her breast. She's raised herself up onto an elbow. Who's that disturbing me from my night's rest? Tis I, tis I, tis I your own true lover. Oh, open the door, love, and let me in, for I am wet, love, and also weary, for I am wet, love, unto thee skin. She's raised herself up with the greatest of pleasure. 
She's raised herself up and she's let him in. And all night long they've rolled in each other's arms until the long night was at an end. And when the long night was past and over, and when the small cocks began to crow, he shook her hand they've kissed and parted. He saddled and mounted and away did go. I love it. Yeah. So that's one of 280 so far. <laughs> yes. And they're all on my YouTube channel. If you search for Melissa Weaver Dunning, you'll find it. I do have some weaving videos there too, but all of my songs are there. Do you have any last words of encouragement for anyone wanting to make no matter what, even when it's hard? <laughs> oh, I think it's just a matter of keeping going. I think it's really important to value what you do. I think it wasn't until I got to be 50 that I realized that it was really okay to be all about what makes you happy, that it doesn't matter what other people think of it. If it makes you happy to knit socks with skulls on them or to weave on a 18th century loom using every possible 18th century material and technique, what, whatever it is that makes you happy, it's good. It has value and you should pursue that. I'm so happy that you're willing to hang out with me for a split minute. <laughs> Yeah, me too. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fane House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards for my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you'll get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You'll also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If that all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. I'm Annie Fane Barillon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. Creativity is nothing but a mind set free. Tori T. Essay.